Okay, first of all, thank everybody for coming. I want to thank, thank you, uh, Shari Tfila, for, uh, for sponsoring this, uh, this course. It, it, if you'll notice, the flyer said it's a three-part interconnected series, because it is interconnected. Um, and uh, we're dealing with different parts, but we'll all come together at the very end. Okay, so you're going to have to sort of watch, and it'll come together as a whole. Tonight, we're dealing with, um, as a, a, what was the dumb title that I made up? Um, <coughs> right, Shabbos, the ultimate politically incorrect holiday. Albert, you know, Shabbos is a sign. We're going to see the wording in the davening, right? And um, one of the most famous um, laws of Shabbat, or Shabbos, or whatever your ethnic orientation is, I uh, will deal with that in a second, um, is that a non-Jew is not allowed to keep Shabbos. It's not allowed to halakhically observe Shabbos. It's the only uh, mitzvah they can do. They want to go around waving lulavim. That's great. They want to spend, you know, like, you know, $25 a pound and eat, like, you know, round cardboard tasting stuff on Pesach because they think that's fun. They're more than welcome to do that, right? But they cannot keep a 100% fully observant Shabbos, right? And our question is going to be, of all mitzvot, why? The introduction that I give to just about every class I ever, ever give, Masa Ko'or, says a Masa Ko'or like this. Um, um, but we just had in the recent parshios. Moshe Rabbeinu comes to the Jewish people. The verse says, Vaydaber Moshe Kenel B'nei Israel." Moshe speaks what God told him to say. He said it to the Jewish people. What did he tell them? There's going to be redemption. We're going to get you out of Egypt. And everything's going to be Andy dandy. And what are the, what's the Jewish people's response? Velo Shamuel Moshe. They didn't listen to Moshe. Why not? They couldn't breathe. They were busy working. And they couldn't listen to him. They were busy building and working away. And they didn't pay attention to him. Ask the Masakor, if you look at the words carefully, it's a little repetitious. It says, Vayedaber Moshe came. Moshe said what God had told him to the Jewish people. And they didn't listen to Moshe. Why did he repeat the word Moshe? Could have said, They didn't listen to him. It's one verse right after the other. Moshe told the Jewish people what he was supposed to say, and they did not listen to him. Why did he say they did not listen to Moshe? Says the Masaka or you know why they didn't listen to him? Because he was Moshe. Meaning, Moshe was the tribe of Levi. They weren't working. They were not building the pyramids. They were not working day and night. They were not getting plastered into walls. Moshe Rabbeinu walks in and out of the palace. His life is just fine. He blows in and he tells the Jewish slaves, guys, it's all going to be amazing. We're going to get, it's all going to be great. Yeah, thank you very much, bud. You are just, you know, living the life of Riley out there, walking in and out of the palace. We're stuck here working our guts out. You don't know what our life is like. And they couldn't listen to him because they did not believe that he understood at all what they were really going through. I don't know you. Some of you I know, sort of. I certainly don't know all the people out there uh, uh, who will be watching this video. I don't know your knowledge base. I don't know your sh Shabbos experience. Both are crucial. Knowledge base is crucial because I don't want to be saying things that like, you know, well, I'm stupid, I know that, right? I don't want to be using terms that say, hello, like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. But I, there's not much I can do, so I'll do the best I can. And I don't know your Shabbos experience. I don't know if, if Shabbos is beautiful and wonderful and you just want to add a little more depth. I don't know if Shabbos, when you were a little kid, was disgusting and horrible and cranky. And that's why you don't do it anymore, right? I don't know if right now your Shabbos experience is terrible. I have no idea, right? I, I doubt if, like my father in America in the 1920s, I don't think anybody is struggling because you can't find a job if you keep Shabbos, that doesn't really exist anymore, but you probably think that you can't become a bazillionaire, uh, possibly you might think that if you don't really believe in divine providence, right? And uh, so I, I don't know your Shabbos experience, which colors what you're going to think, because if Shabbos is great and fun, you're into it. If Shabbos is quaint, you're coming in with a chip on your shoulder, so I have no idea, so I'll just do the best I can, that's my opening. Second opening is, um, I, I don't know which word, there are people in this world that the word Shabbat makes them uncomfortable, it's Shabbos. And there are people that the word Shabbos makes them uncomfortable. It's Shabbat. Okay, so you just got to let that go, folks. Okay, and I'm just going to say Shabbos because that's how I grew up. And to me, it's Shabbos. I could say Shabbat if I had to. And if I really thought that would make a difference, if you would believe anything I say, I would say the word Shabbat is a scam to make you like me more. But uh, I grew up as Shabbos, and, and we're just going to call it Shabbos. Okay, Gvaltic. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so question number one. On this whole topic of, and again, the issue is, what do you mean it's a sign? Non-Jews can't keep Shabbos. You have to understand why 
it's, it's such an enigma. Why this is such a big question? Watch the following. Some background. There's a book called the Sefer Akuzri. Rabbi Yudha Levi wrote the Sefer Akuzri. He lived in the uh, 1100s, is she something? Mid-1100s. And he wrote a book called the Sefer Akuzri. It purports to be the debate between the king of the Khazar kingdom and um, various religions, because he was looking to find the true religion. As a total and complete aside, if you look around, you will discover there actually was a Khazar kingdom, uh, 760, 780, 790, something like that in that area, in the approximate Kiev, Ukraine area of the world. They did convert to Judaism. Certainly the leaders converted to Judaism. Um, secularists will say they converted because just of, uh, for financial reasons. Um, a legend uh, has it that he was searching for the truth, the king of the Khazars, and he had a debate in his royal court, and Judaism won. They did convert to Judaism. We do have letters. There are letters that exist from the Jewish king of the Khazars to Chazdai ibn Shaprut, who was a minister in Spain, and it's in Oxford. These letters are around. They've been researched by scholars. And, and there, were, there were Jewish kings and Jewish generals with names like Hanukkah and Pesach, and they write about the conversion, and Jewish scholars came there. There definitely was a Jewish kingdom called Khazaria with Jewish kings who clearly were <coughs> religious. It eventually got wiped out. We're not going to go into the history of it. It just got all destroyed. I got it just killed out and wiped out eventually, uh, I don't know, about the year 900 or something like that. Okay, so Rabbi Yudha Levi um, wrote a book. Uh, he writes it as if this is the debate that took place in the court of the king. Whether he really had a, uh, a record of that debate or he just used it as a literary style, the purpose of the book is to prove that Judaism is the, the, the true religion and to answer all questions that people have about religion. It's one of the basic books when people want to uh, understand um, the validity of Judaism and why we believe that Christianity is simply not true and Islam is not true and all the famous questions that people have about Judaism. It's studied uh, when I was principal at Ferris Base Yaakov. We used to be the principal of a, of a girls' high school here. I retired because I wanted to be one of those principals who uh, walked out the door while everybody likes them rather than get wheels out the door when you don't know what you're talking about anymore. Uh, and so we taught it. It was a, a two-year course in, in, in grades 10 and 11. It's called the Safer Hakuzri. So it doesn't matter whether it's the real debate or whether he just created it. But, but let me tell you how his presentation is the most classic, basic elements of, in, in all you know, the, the, the courses of when we try and, and, and understand the difference between Christianity and Islam on one side and Judaism on the other. So in the book, the way it's set up, see, he calls in first the Christian. Interestingly enough, by the way, he says, why am I not even going to bother to call in the Jews? Because the Jews are obviously not God's chosen people. Jews are clearly not doing what God wants because they're treated like garbage. Why does God have them? being treated like garbage. Think, you know, 700s, by the way, don't think now, right? And so they're clearly not doing what God wants because they're, 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 they're a mess. Christianity, Islam, they seem to have success. They must be doing the right thing. So he calls in the Christian. He says, Christian, tell me what your belief system is. And the Christian starts with, we believe God created the world and everybody dates back from Adam, right? And then everything that's in the, the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, all the way through, da, da, da. Then come along Jesus and, and he changed everything. And the king just, it's, it's not, not the point. The king just says, well, that's very nice, but how do we know Jesus changed it? I never met the guy, and, and that's, it's his word against everybody else. Thank you. Calls him the Muslim. The Muslim says, we believe in creation, and everybody, uh, God created the world in six days, the seventh day, and Adam, and the flood, da da da, everything in the Jewish uh, Bible, da 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 da. Right? And then came along Muhammad, and God spoke to Muhammad, and then Muhammad changed it all. And you got to do what Muhammad says. And he said, well, how, how do I know God spoke to Muhammad? He says, let me call the Jews, because everybody seems to start with the Jews. Everybody says, everything is yet, God created the world, there was an Adam, there was an Eve, right? There was a Noah, there was a flood, there was an Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, da 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 right, Jewish people, blah, 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 and then Jesus came along and changed the whole show. They came along, Muhammad, and he changed the whole show. And he calls in the Jew. And the Jew says, he says, so what do you believe in? The Jew says, well, I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, we believe that uh, the Jews were slaved in Egypt, and God did ten plagues, and he did miracles, and he split the sea, and he took them out into the desert, and, 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 and three million people all heard God speak, and three million people saw the plagues, and three million people saw the sea split, and, and God spoke to three million people and gave them the Torah, and we got to do what it says. And the king flips out at him. 
and, and it's like a rant. And he says, what are you, stupid? It's not exactly how he says it, but I'm teaching 10th grade girls. That's how I phrase it. What are you, stupid? He said, what happened to creation? You left out creation. What are you, an idiot? All religions are based on creation. What do you think we do what God says? Because God created the world, and God created you, and therefore you better get with a program. You left out creation. You guys don't believe that God created the world? Don't you believe God created the world? Yeah, we believe God created the world. But, but that has nothing to do with our religion, and that's not what we base ourselves on. We base ourselves on the fact that three million Jews saw ten plagues in Egypt, and God split the sea, and he spoke to us about Sinai, and Shazam, that's what you got to do. So he says, so if you're not descended from the people that that happened to, then you don't have to do your religion? He said, no, not at all. The Jewish religion is based on God spoke to God, three million people at Mount Sinai, took them out of Egypt, and them and all their descendants got to do what God says. You're right. We're not based on creation. He even says, you know why we're not based on creation? Because we weren't there at creation. And he says, and look at the Ten Commandments. When God introduced himself to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, what did he say? Hello, everybody. Anochi, Hashem Elokecha. I'm the Lord your God. Asher, who, Hotse Sicha, took you out of Egypt. Anochi, Hashem Elokecha, Hotse Sicha, I'm the God who took you out of Egypt. God didn't say, yo, hello, everybody. I'm the God that created heaven and earth. He didn't, he didn't say that about himself. He didn't say that. Because they would have said, you're the God who created heaven and earth? Says who? But when God said, did you guys get out of Egypt? Oh, man, sure, see, I was all playing the frogs and the blood, right? And the magas, bacharos, and the locusts, where the sea split. It was unbelievable. He said, well, you know who did it? I did it. And they said, really? Thanks, God. What can we do for you? And he said, 613 commandments. And they said, why are we sorry we asked? Okay, that's not what they said, right? But that's the conversation. Continues the Jew explaining to the king. When Moses went to Pharaoh with the, let my people go. You know, Charlton Heston there, no, with a watch on his hand because they messed it up, right? The old Charlton Heston, let my people go. Ten commit, right? He goes into Pharaoh and he says, yo, Pharaoh, you know who I am? He said, what do you want? He says, I'm Moses. Yeah, and who do you represent? I represent Elokeha Ivrim. I represent the God of the Ivrim. Avram Ha'ivri. Why did he say I represent the God who created heaven and earth? Because Pharaoh would have said, you represent the God who created heaven and earth? Who the heck created heaven and earth? No, I wasn't there. You weren't there. Anybody know? Nobody was there. Who the heck knows who created heaven and earth? He said, I, you know, I, I, oh, the God of the Ivrim. That's Abraham. Everybody knew Abraham. Abraham won the world war quite a couple of years earlier. Uh, Abraham, um, Jacob, they knew Jacob. Jacob came to Egypt. Joseph, you know, they, 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 they certainly knew the Ivrim. And so Pharaoh said, fine, so what does your God want? He said, he wants to let the Jewish people go. He said, well, you know what? You got your God, I got my God. I bet my God's better than your God, so drop that. And Moses said, okay, we'll see. But Moses did not say, hi, the God who created heaven and earth sent me. Because we don't base ourselves on creation. As a matter of fact, the king even says, so wait a minute. So that means that we don't have to do this religion. And they said, absolutely, of course not. Jesus came to save the whole world. And he didn't accomplish that. Maybe he accomplished a lot. If he didn't accomplish that, well, he's going to come back. When he comes back, we'll discuss it. <laughs> Muhammad came to change the whole world. Didn't accomplish that. Moses never came to change the whole world. We don't change the whole world. It's, it's for us. It's our religion. You want to join? You can join. It's a little expensive. 613 commandments, but you don't have to. Keep the seven, go to heaven. Seven Noahide laws, and you're good, and we're all happy, and everyone's fine, everyone's thrilled. We don't believe in getting converts. You want to join? It's your choice. Because we're not crazy, based on creation. We don't do the 613 commandments because God created the world. If we did the 613 because God created the world, then everybody should do them because God created everybody. We do the 613 commandments because God took us out of Egypt. He chose us, and he did ten plagues for us, and he got us out of Egypt, and he spoke to us, and he gave us a mission to the world, us and all our descendants. And if you're born into it, you just got to get with the program. If you're not born into it, want to join, you can join. This is a process to join, but you absolutely don't have to, and everything is fine and dandy, and we love you. That's the whole introduction 
the whole first, I don't know, 60, 80 pages of the Sefer Hakuzari is all based on, that, that's, that's, that's his whole introduction, that what makes Judaism unique, we're not based on creation, we're not a worldwide, worldwide religion, we're based specifically on Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, Zechel Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, Zechel Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, our unique relationship with God is because he took us out of Egypt and he didn't do that for anybody else. And because of that, we're a unique, special nation. We're the Am Nivchar, we're the chosen people. When non-Jews say, you know, you Jews, you guys have a chosen people mentality, that's not true. We don't have a chosen people mentality. We are the chosen people. It's not a mentality, it's a reality. And it's not racist, because anybody can become part of the chosen people, you can join. Anybody in the world you want to join, you can join. So if you want to be part of the chosen people, so join. Just stop crabbing about it, right? Don't argue about it. There's the chosen people, and there's not the chosen people. And we're the chosen people. And God chose us, and we're the Am Nivkar, and we're the Am Segula. We have a Segula, which non-Jews don't have. Now, this makes, makes some people uncomfortable, but you know what? The fact that you're uncomfortable makes me uncomfortable. So I decided that I'd rather have you be uncomfortable than me be uncomfortable, so I don't care if you're uncomfortable. Because you shouldn't be uncomfortable when you hear truth, and if you disagree with the truth, don't be uncomfortable, just disagree. I would like you to disagree. There's no concept of being uncomfortable. It's a concept that was just created in today's time because no one wants to talk truth, so they just go by emotions. Side, pardon me, little rant from a seven-year-old guy who really still believes in values and truth and not... I'm okay, you're okay, one and one is whatever makes you comfortable is one and one, right? Okay, we apologize. Actually, I don't apologize. We are the Am Segula. What does it mean to be the Am Segula? What does it mean we're the Am Segula, we're God's special treasure? So the truth is, there's a beautiful letter from Rav Cook, the uh, first chief rabbi of, of Palestine, right, when it, was, when it was still Palestine. It's in the context of a whole bunch of other things, right, but, but, but it's, it's in the book, Selected Letters of Avram of, of Yisrael Cohen Cook. And, and he writes like this, he writes a very beautiful idea. He says, you should know there are two main things that together build the holiness of Israel and the divine connection to them. There's two things that connect us to the divine. The first is Iskula, that we're God's special treasure. And what does this mean? It's the nature of holiness that is in the soul of the Jewish people as a legacy. We inherited it from the patriarchs, from the matriarchs. As it says, you shall be my segula mikal ha'amid. This segula is an inner holy power which God's will was to inlay in the nature of the soul. And it like the nature of everything existing, cannot be changed. If you're Jewish, you're born with it, and you got it. You can activate it, you cannot activate it, you can disregard it, but, but you got it. Because it exists. And whatever God created exists forever. Who am I? Everything exists forever. Of course, then the other connection we have to the good Lord is using our free will. We do mitzvot, we study Torah, the more holy things we do, the closer we connect to God. Truth is, he says, that segula, that inner sanctity and holiness, really creates a more powerful bond. But it has to be activated. You can disregard it. You may not even know necessarily you have it, right? But it exists. Whether you activate it, act on it, whether you even know you're Jewish or not, it's there and you pass it on to your children, from mother to child, by mother to child, not father to child, is for a different lecture series. When we, about men, women, etc. okay? Rav Cook goes on, by the way, to explain, he said, in the footsteps of the coming of Mashiach, Ikvis of the Mashiach, right, as we are getting closer and closer, we all know that the, the, the Kabbalists tell us the world will only exist for 6,000 years, and we're in 5,780, there's only 220 to go, clearly you see world history is accelerating at a dramatic pace, right, Chavaz Chaim's famous concept, as you see, we're getting closer to the end of times, right, if you look at world history, it, it usually developed quite slowly. If you would take a human being who lived in 1450, and parachuted him into 1550, he wouldn't find life much different. And if he went from 1550 to 1650, he still wouldn't have found life too much different. 1650 to 1750, a little more. 1750 to 1850, Industrial Revolution. 1850 to 1950, wow, airplanes, television, 
1950, you don't have to jump 100 years. 1950 to 1990, 1990 to 2000, 2000. Go back five, ten years and what's the world different? Who's in charge? Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys in the world? Technology. Things have dramatically changed. You, you, in your pockets, you have more computing power than they had you know, in, in, in the 1950s. All right? uh, I remember when I got my, my first computer, I had a 20 gigabyte hard drive. It was like that big. Right? You know what I mean? Right? And, and you know, I'm not 100 years old. Okay? The world's accelerating at a dramatic pace. We're at the end of time. Says Ralph Cook, at the end of times, the power of Segula will become greatly strengthened in order to bring the Jewish people closer so they'll be attuned to the arrival of the Mashiach. He said that's why you can find Jews who do bad deeds, right? Meaning they, you, free will-wise, they claim they don't believe in God and they don't believe in the Torah, yet they're unbelievably connected to the Jewish people. We never had that. People converted out and left. People left the shtetl and never came back. People converted to Christianity because financially it was more viable. The concept of people who were not Torah observant but felt very Jewish is a new phenomenon, you understand. Historically, that never existed, right? It never existed. Either you were in or you were out, right? The concept of, you know, are there any Jews on the plane, right? You know, where, where does that come from? That's the school. As we get closer to the time of Mashiach, there's that inner school. Right? Why does he, Theodore Herzl, his original, Theodore Herzl's original plan, remember, was how he's going to solve the Jewish problem, right? His plan was what? Was to have everybody convert to Christianity, right? Which was smart and made it actually a heck of a lot of sense, right? And, but it wouldn't fly. He, he was so disappointed, he was so bitterly disappointed that no one would buy into that because it made so much sense. And all his friends, none of us, you, you don't believe in Judaism, you don't believe in Bible, you don't believe in anything, convert to Christianity, and then you can go to university and no one will bother you. And he couldn't understand why it wouldn't fly. It wouldn't fly because of Segula. There's that inner Jewish sense. People just feel there's that sense. And we all, in and, and today's day and age, we see it more and more and more. Jews have that, non-Jews don't. And therefore, non-Jews don't. And therefore, Judaism is for Jews who have the skula. By the way, when you convert, if it's something you're born with, as a Sefer Kuzi explains, it started with Adam. Adam had it. It went down one person to one person. Eventually, Abraham got it. Abraham passed it to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob. Jacob passed it to all his 12 sons. And then at the covenant at Sinai, when we became the Jewish people, when God spoke to 3 million people simultaneously, bam! Everybody got it, for better or for worse, and then switched and got handed down by mothers, not fathers, which is a different topic, as I said. And now everybody's born with it, for better or for worse. How did, how did converts get it? They're born again. You know the concept of born again Christians? They stole it from us. Of course, that's exactly where it comes from. The Gemara says, a gershon is a little dummy. A convert who converts, they're like a newborn baby. So much so a newborn baby that in absolute theory, if a brother and sister convert, they're really not brother and sister because they're newborn and they're not really related. And theoretically, they could marry each other. Okay, they don't, but in an in, 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 in abstract concept. So here we go. So the Jewish people are based on the fact that they have this inner skula which came on to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. We base our religion not on creation. We base our religion on Sinai. That's why only those who are at Sinai and their descendants have to do the religion in the first place. Yet what's Shabbat? What's the most famous prayer of Shabbat? Shamu B'nai Yisrael HaShabbos, right? You know, you say that when you hold that little plastic cup of grape juice. That's this, this Kabbalistic reasons. Plastic, the numerical value of the word plastic relates to God. 70 times God is plastic. I just made that up. Okay, that's not true. You do not have to hold a little plastic cup of grape juice. You don't even have to drink any grape juice to fulfill your obligation of Kiddush. You just have to hear someone make Kiddush, and the person, somebody has to drink some grape juice. But if you're not holding the little plastic cup, trust me, you're not going to burn in hell. That should be your biggest problem when you get in 120 years. You didn't hold that little plastic cup of grape juice. But I see people like freaking, I don't have my plastic cup of grape juice. Charm, Rovin, A, you sell us a Shabbos. Jewish people keep the Shabbos, right? Friday night, we say it in our davening, in Karlbach Binyanim, it's become famous to put the Karlbach tune to it, okay? The Shamu B'nai Yisrael as Shabbos. Jewish people keep the Shabbos. La Sot et the Shabbat, le Doro Sam Bariso Lam. We keep the Shabbos forever as an everlasting covenant, Beini Uvein B'nai Yisrael. 
This is a sign, a covenant between me, says God, and the Jewish people. Because non-Jews don't have Shabbos. Oh, see, Leolam, it's an everlasting sign that what? God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. <laughs> what? It's a sign between me and the Jewish people that God created the world. But Judaism is not based on creation. They also have creation. The whole point of the Sefer Kuzi was that when the Christian said, what do we believe? He started with creation. When the Muslim said, what do we believe? He started with creation. And when the Jews said, what do you believe? He didn't even say creation. <laughs> and yet, what's Shabbat? Creation. And not Jews can't do it. That is the problem. You hear it? <laughs> Gewalt. Next problem. As you may or may not know, either you like, I knew that, or like, hey, that's so cool, I didn't know that, right? Uh, one of the two, is that um, during the week we pray three times a day, Shachris Min Chamar, morning, afternoon, and evening, the prayer service, the Amidah. The Amidah is really what prayer is. Everything else is introductory or finishing up. When we talk about prayer, obligation to pray, to pray three times a day, we talk about the Amidah with the, silent, the Shemona Esrei, called Shemona Esrei, because Shemona Esrei is 18, and there's 19 blessings in it. But why, there, why is it called 18 when there's 19 blessings? Jews are usually pretty good at math. It's also not part of this discussion. Because there was originally 18, then they added in a 19th. So it's called Shemona Esrei, or Amidah, because we say you're standing up. The Amidah for Shachas Min Chamar is, is, is ex basically exactly the same. Certainly the middle brachot are the same. One little brachot, the end, Sim Shalom, Shalom Rav, if you dive in Nusach Ashkenaz, right, is different. But otherwise it's the same. Three times a day the same. Three times a day the same. Right? If you're davening on, 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 on holidays, three times a day the same. Shabbat, they're not the same. Did you know that? The Friday night Amidah, the Shabbos morning Amidah, and the Shabbos afternoon Amidah ain't the same. Watch. The Friday night Amidah, well, the opening three brachot and the ending three brachot are always the same. That's the structure of Shimon S, right? Opening three brachot, which we... Uh, uh, we discuss God's power because no point in talking to God if you don't think he controls stuff. And the ending is in which we thank God for all the stuff we got because you don't ask and say, but how about thank you for what you already do have? Oh, yeah, I, and thanks for what I do have. Right? But the middle is the middle. Friday night, the middle is the section from Genesis, from Bracious, which talks about Shabbat. God finished the heaven and the earth. He finished all the work that he did. And God rested on the seventh day. And he blessed the seventh day. Because on the seventh day, God rested from all the work that he did. Discusses creation. Viter, back to creation. What's this creation? I mean, it does represent, right? Seventh day he rested. Right? But that's... So talks about creation. Shabbos morning. Shabbos morning, what do we say? Yisma, we don't say Vayichulu. We don't read that chapter, that section from Genesis, from Bereshis, which discusses that set Shabbat is the seventh day, the day that God rested. We don't mention that. We talk about Yismach Moshe b'matnel chelko kievenem on karasalo. Moshe should be happy with that great gift that he received. He received the luchos at Mount Sinai. He got the tablets. He got the Torah. Evenem on kakalilti first. Bro, show us out the bundle of anechal har Sinai. Moshe stood up on Mount Sinai. Ushne luchot avanim harid biado, and he brought down the two luchos, which kasubem shemir shabbos, which. In the Ten Commandments on those two tablets, it happens to mention Shabbos. But we're talking about Mount Sinai. So Friday night we're talking about Shabbos Bracious, as the commentaries say. The Shabbos of Bracious, the Shabbos of creation. Shabbos morning we're talking about Shabbos of Matan Torah. Tradition tells us that the Torah was given on Shabbos. In that Amidah, we then say, 
God did not give Shabbos to the nations of the world. Lo hin chalto, he didn't give it as an inheritance. Lo ovde psilim to those who worship idols. Vagam be menuchato lo yishkenu arelim. Non Jews may not rest on the Shabbat. Ki Yisrael amcha nesato biahava. You gave it to your nation Israel. Zera Yaakov asher bam bacharta. You gave it to the descendants of Yaakov that you chose. Shabbos morning, we mentioned non-Jews are not allowed to keep it. Shabbos morning is when we talk about the Shabbat in which the Torah was given. Mincha and Shabbos. What do we talk about? Ata echad, ata echad, v'shem cha echad, v'miki am cha Yisrael. Some synagogues sing it if the tune rings the bell. Ata echad, you are one, v'shem cha echad, your name is one, v'miki am cha Yisrael, goya cha bars, and your nation is, you will sing a teferis, gudu lova, teres yishua, yo menucha kudusha l'amcha, nasata avram, goya el Yitzchak, Yaakov, menucha semes, menucha sholom, hashke, betach, menucha shleima, total rest, peace, calm, comfort. What total peace, what calm, what comfort? We're not in total peace. We don't have calm. We don't have comfort. Say the commentaries. You know what Shabbat is talking about? Messiah coming. The days of Mashiach are called Yom Shekulo Shabbat. When the Messiah comes, every day will be Shabbos. Because there will be calm and peace and no war and no troubles and no pain and no sickness. And we'll all be calm and restful. Friday night, we talk about Shabbos Breshis, the Shabbos of creation. Shabbos morning, we talk about the Shabbat, the day that, that, that God gave the Ten Commandments. And there's where we mention non-Jews can't do Shabbat. Shabbat Mincha, we talk about the Shabbat, the days of the Messiah, which will all be like Shabbat. What's going on here? So what, what is Shabbat? So Shabbat we, is creation? Shabbat is a prelude to the Messiah? Shabbat represents giving the Torah at Sinai? What, 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 what's Shabbat a symbol of? What are we thinking about on Shabbat? Well, let's look at Kiddush, folks. What do we say at Kiddush? So at Kiddush, we mix and match the Friday night Kiddush, which is the main Kiddush, right? Obligation to be Mekaddish, the Shabbos on wine, when, when Shabbat uh, starts. The why wine we'll talk about next class. Wine, women, and song. That's the next class. What do we do on Kiddush Friday night? First, we start with Vayichul HaShemayim Vars V'chal Tzavam. God finished creation. Vayishbot Bayom HaShvi. He rested on the seventh day. So we start with creation. The second half, we say, Asher Kitshanu with Mitzvotav. God sanctified us with his commandments. Right? He wanted us. Shabbat Kachu B'Avav G'Ratzon Hin Chilanu. God gave us the Shabbat. Zikaron. What are the next words? A remembrance. The Maseberashis. A remembrance of creation. Yom Tchilal Mikroi Kodesh. It's the first holiday we ever got. Zechel, the Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. We remember the Exodus. Are we remembering creation? Or are we remembering the Exodus? What's going on here? That's the enigma of Shabbat. Well, time's up, and we'll leave it for next week. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. To solve it all, so um, I apologize to those who have heard me speak many times in Shari Tfila on, on Rosh Hashanah during the explanatory services. You must have heard this before, but it just so happens that this is just the best concept to deal with it. The entire, the entire idea here is based on the following concept. Um, uh, I once got a brochure in the mail, and it was a big, glossy advertising brochure, Right, and 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 on it had a big big cover, and it had like these, these uh, like a fancy suit or something, and it says, "You are not the clothes you wear." And I said, "Whoa, that that's true. I mean, clothes are just clothes." Whoosh, turn it open. Big fancy house. You are not the house you live in. I said, "That that that's true. You're not the house you live. In. That's a house." Whoosh, big fancy car. It says, "You're not the car you drive." I said, "Oh, that's for sure. You're not the car you drive. It's a car." From offices, you're not the job that you have. I said, you're right, jobs, it's a job, right? You, less age, says, you are your watch. 
And it had advertisements for like $10,000 watches. I said, good Lord, what kind of sugar in their head would spend 10,000 bucks on a fresh stuck in a watch? I said, and how's anybody supposed to know it costs you 10,000 bucks? The knockoffs you buy in Times Square for 10 bucks looks the same thing. But do you walk around with a price tag so people can see it? I mean, you can support people. People are dying of cancer. You're on a $10,000 watch. You don't even look at it to tell the time. You look at your phone anyways, for God's sakes. I said, like, what kind of lunatic would spend money like that, right? You are your watch. I, I used to do what I taught in Tavares de Sacco, so in, in, in grade nine, in ninth grade, for uh, those who are listening in the United States of America, right? Uh, in ninth grade, um, I, I did a project. I would tell the girls like this. So can everybody take out a piece of paper, right? Either don't put your name on it, and I want you to write a paragraph, just who are you? Describe who are you? Without using your name, obviously. No name. Just who are you? Right? Who are you? What are you? Who are you? Describe yourself. Who are you? And then we collect them and we read them. And I would point out, look what different kids wrote. Some kids wrote, I'm the third uh, child in a family of, 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 you know, of, of, of six kids, and, uh, right? Some people say, I'm, 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 you know, I'm five foot, you know, four feet tall with brown <laughs> hair. Some people describe them based on their family, right? You know, I'm the fourth kid, and I have a father who's a lawyer, my mother's a da da da. Some kids describe some what they look like. I'm five foot this, and this color eyes, this color hair. Some says, I'm, I'm very athletic. And some kids describe, you know, I'm, I'm very sensitive, I'm very intuitive, uh, right? How do you describe yourself? So my purpose was, that you, you, who and what do you assume you are? If, if your understanding of who and what you are is that you're five foot two and you have, you know, blonde hair and you have a nice complexion, so if that's all you have, you know, when your pimples start breaking out, you're going to fall apart because you have no identity, right? And, and, and if you describe yourself by, you know, who your parents are, but so, you know, when the, when the marriage falls apart and they get divorced, so then you are nobody, right? And, of course, who are you? See, there's what you do and there's who you are. What you do should reflect who you are. Not that what you do creates who you are. We're going to do that again. There's what you do and there's who you are. What you do should be a reflection of who you are. You do not use what you do to create who you are. Shalom Aleichem, what's your name? Name's Ruvain Schwartz. Oh, hi, Shalom Ruvain Schwartz. Well, what do you do? I'm a lawyer. What did he say? I am a lawyer. No, you're not, Ruvain Schwartz. You are not a lawyer. You do lawyering. That's what you do. But who are you? I'm kind. I'm selfish. I believe in saving the whales. I struggle with A, B, and C. That's who you are. For 9, 10, 11, 12 hours a day, you do lawyering. You do architecture. You do doctoring. That's what you do. But we've been so ingrained in Western culture that I am a doctor. I am a lawyer. I am an architect. It's what you do. It's not who you are. Let's take it deeper. Very difficult concept. Bear with me. Kabbalists tell us like this. Shri Das talks, um, yes, Shri Das talks about this at length. Right? We say, every, oh, later. I, I don't know what you know. Everybody says, oh, later. Everybody says, oh, later. Right? We get to the end of the What do we say? Right? Ephes Malkenu, Ephes Ulaso. FS, well, there's nothing else but God. Ain od. There's nothing else. There is nothing else in the world but God. Ki Hashem hu Elohim, b'shamay mimal. God is in total, he's up in the heavens. Allah oris mitachas. God's down here on earth. Ain od. It doesn't say ain od koach, there's no other power, or there's no other ruler, or there's no other king. It says ain od, there is nothing else. Before that, we say, uh, uh, He's our God. Ain't, there's nothing else. Emes Malkenu, 
Efes zulaso. Our king is true. There is nothing else besides God. Two things cannot exist in the same space. God is everywhere. God is here. God is there. God is truly everywhere. Up, up, down, down, left, right, all around. Da, 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 da. It's where we can be found. Right? Fair, Uncle Moshe. Don't argue with Uncle Moshe, okay? All right? God's everywhere. So how did God create a world? What is the table? If, there's, if this is a table, so God, God's not here. There's a table here. But there's nothing else in the world but God. So how can there be a table if there's nothing else but God? It's not true. There's God in tables. And there's God in watches. So what do you mean there's nothing else but God? There's a watch. There's not a watch. There's God. It's not God. It's a watch. So what do you mean there's nothing else but God? This looks like a, looks like a watch to me. Truth is, there is no watch here. There's not a watch. There's no table. There's nothing else but God. In order for humans to be able to fulfill the Torah and do what God wants, which is to exist on this earth and choose good within the choices of good and evil, and that's what we're here for, why he needed this to be done is a different series, right? But that's what he said. So we, we, we can't choose good and evil if there be no tables and, and, and no watches. We need stuff. We need stuff. I need a table so I can put food on it and do a mix of giving somebody else to eat. I need a table so I can pick it up and throw it across the room in anger and break it and do a sit or steal it, right? Or help somebody else carry it out to their car because they need to borrow it or steal it out of their house and sell it on the black market. There's got to be stuff in the world so that we can use it to serve God. So in our limited capacity as humans, because unfortunately we only have five senses, which really limits our ability to see everything that's going on and see reality as it is, because we now today we even know that this table is not exactly what it appears to be. It's, it's really moving molecules and energy. We know that, right? We, we know a lot more about this table than we ever did before, right? So really... God allowed, in our human terms, to perceive the world as if there is stuff here for the purpose of being able to serve God. But that's the only reason all this stuff exists. So if you use the stuff in the world not for the purpose of serving God, then then you believe there's things other than God in this world. There's God, but sometimes you can just put God in your pocket, and now there's just me and my stomach and my, I just me, for what purpose? For me. I worried about God this morning. This evening, this is Feigenbaum time. There's no Feigenbaum. Feigenbaum is here to serve God. In order for Feigenbaum to serve God, he needs to be well-fed, because he can't serve God very well if he's hungry. In order for Feigenbaum to serve God, he needs clothes. And in order for Feigenbaum to serve God, he needs to get a good night's sleep. In order for Feigenbaum to serve God, um, he needs sometimes to take a vacation. Otherwise, Feigenbaum's going to be really cranky, and he won't be able to do the midst of being nice to your wife and being kind and patient with people, because God created humans that they need vacations. In order for Feigenbaum to take a vacation, Feigenbaum needs money. In order for Feigenbaum to get the money, in order to be able to buy the food which will keep him well fed so that he can do mitzvot and teach Torah and hold doors open for little old ladies and, and give people rides in his car. I can't have a car in which to drive to synagogue to and give rides to people to unless I have money to buy that car in order to buy the car. I have to go to work and do whatever I got to do, right? But I wake up in the morning and I eat breakfast for what purpose? So that I could go to work. I'm going to work so I could make money. I'm going to make money so I can buy stuff I need. I need stuff in order to what? In order to retire and veg out on the beach until I die. Oh, then why are you on this earth? To serve yourself. Then you're an idol worshiper. Oh, yeah, you pull God out of your pocket when you need him. Everybody needs God every once in a while. But then when he gets in the way, you just put him back in your pocket and say, okay, now don't bug me, now it's my time. There's nothing else but God in the world. I get up and eat breakfast so that I can be healthy, so that I can get to work, 
so that I can make money, so that with the money I can buy stuff and do things which will give me the ability to accomplish my purpose on this earth, which for me is to teach Torah and hold doors open for little old ladies and to answer emails of people that have questions, and for you it might be to, to give charity and to help orphans and to volunteer for, uh, for, for organizations and to raise money to fix up this social hall, right? And uh, they still collect them for that around here, right? And, 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 and whatever it is, and to support you know, worthy causes and to teach Torah and to be nice to people. The 613 mitzvot, you've got plenty of choices of what you can do. So when I go to sleep at night, I'm going, not going to sleep at night for me. I'm going to sleep at night for God, because God needs a well-rested Feigenbaum. Because not well-rested Feigenbaums will do sins and bad stuff. Well-rested Feigenbaums will hopefully do the right thing. But that's what the material world is here for, because it doesn't really exist. It's a figment of our imagination that God allowed to exist, in order that we can serve God, because all that exists on this world is accomplishing beautiful things, make the world a better place, and fulfilling the values that God gave us. And that's why the 613 commandments, and that's why the laws of Judaism apply to armies, and to economy, and, and, and to old age people, and to the environment, and to how you run your postal service, and, and every aspect of life can be infused with sanctity and kedusha. How do we accomplish this? How do we make sure that we're focused on this? Number seven. Somebody once asked me a question. You know, I don't say I thought Jewish people are really good at math. Okay, well, well, let's say they are. That's a racist comment, but I'll accept it as it is. Jews are good at math. So what bothers you? You know what bothers me? You know what I discovered? I just got my calendar from, you know, my Jewish calendar from whatever store I gave them out. And you know what's funny? I said, what's funny? He says, you know, Rosh Hashanah, the new year? I said, yeah, the new year. He said, that, you know, that ain't the first month in a calendar. I said, you're right, bud. Right? He said, the first month of the Jewish calendar is Nisan. He said, I said, Rosh Hashanah comes out in month seven. So why are we wishing people Happy New Year in month seven? Like, no, I can't do, like, figure that out. Like, Happy New Year is month one. He said, no, no, Happy New Year is month seven. Why is New Year month seven? What's month one? We just had it in the Torah reading. The first mitzvah the Jews got as a nation. Abraham had circumcision. As a nation in the land of Egypt, what was the first commandment? This month, the month of Nisan, the month of the Exodus, that will be the first month of the year. That was the first thing. Moshe said, God says, Moses and Aaron, yeah, we're Korean Jewish people, yeah, we're all pumped up, yeah, we're all pumped up, man. Okay, it's going to be a Jewish nation, it's going to be great, it's going to be, you're going to have a lot of commandments, it's the first one, you ready? Number one, number one, God, what's it, let's go, what's the very first thing we got to know? You know what the first thing I got to know is? What? That the month of Nisan, yeah, that's month number one. Yeah? Yeah, and, and, that's it, thank you very much. Oh, and also, you're going to have to bring a Paschal sacrifice, and you're also going to have to eat matzah, which costs 25 bucks a pound, and you have to clean the refrigerators with a toothbrush, and, and a lot of other stuff. But the first one is, Nisan, that's the first commandment to the Jewish people. Yes! Because we start our year by the fact that we became a nation, and we have a value system, we have a purpose on this earth. Do we care about the material world? Absolutely. We celebrate the creation of the material world. But we celebrate it in month number seven. Why seven? You've heard this before from me. Number six represents a material world with no value. The six days of the work week. Amalek, the great nemesis of the Jewish people, the nation that represents evil for the sake of evil. The numerical value of Amalek is 240. Two plus four is six. And I've told you before, before Purim time, I was taking a haircut when I still lived in Israel. The little Sephardi fellow came in and he says, huh? You know what the gematria of Amalek is? I said, yeah, sure. Numerical value of Amalek is 240. He goes, aha, do you know what else is 240? I said, no, I give up. What else? He goes, mas hach nasa, income tax, is also 240. <laughs> and dalid vav lamed resh, dollar, is also 240. Amalek, evil. Number six. Six is a material world, the six days of the week. 6,000 years before Mashiach comes. Six represents material world without sanctity. Seven represents a material world infused with sanctity. Eight is above. The Mosa Mashiach, when Mashiach comes, the world will stay the same. 
most opinions. It just will be clarity, it will be truth, and there'll be values because people will get it. Shabbat is seven. We've been through this before. You know Shabbat, the number seven, one, I've done it a thousand times just in case people haven't heard it. How do you start Shabbat? You light candles. What's the Hebrew word for a candle? Nair. Nun Reish. Nun is 50. Reish is 200. 250. 2 plus 5 is 7. What do you do after you light candles? You make Kiddush on wine. Hebrew word for wine? Yayin. Yud. Yud. Nun. Yud is 10. 10, 20, and another 50 is 70. That's 7. After the wine, what do you do? You make a motzi on challah. Ches, lamed, hey. Ches is 8. Lamed is 30. That's 38. Hey is another 5. 38 and 5. 43. 4 plus 3. 7. After the challah, what do you have? You have fish. Dag. Dalid gimel. 3 plus 4 is 7. After the fish, you have soup. Mem, reish, kuf. Marak. Mem is 40. Reish is 200. 240 plus a kuf is 100. It's 343 plus 4 is 7. After the marak, you have meat. Basar, dagim, mechomatamim. Basar. Base, shin, reish. That's shin and reish is a, is, is a 500. A base is 2. 502. 2 plus 5 is 7. Shabbat is 7. Chul doesn't work, okay? Uh, but Kugel does, I think if you spell it Kigel, one of my students once figured that out. Depends if you say Kugel or Kigel. Shabbat is seven. How do we greet people on Shabbat? Shabbat Sameach? No. What do we say? Shabbat Shalom. Shalom is 376. Three plus seven is 10. 10 plus six is 16. One plus six is seven. Shalom is Shlemut, peace. Wholeness. The word shalom means peace. Shalem means completion. Wholeness. Because it's the material world and the spiritual world all fused together for one purpose, to serve God. So we celebrate Shabbat by eating and drinking and you need, you're, you're obligated to have special Shabbat clothes and special Shabbat foods and if you have little kids, they have their Shabbat pajamas. And all my grandchildren have their Shabbat cereals. That's where they can have their sugared cereals. They have their Shabbos pajamas and their Shabbos cereals. And we have our Shabbos clothing and our Shabbos hats and our Shabbos suits and our Shabbos tablecloths because we infuse the material world with sanctity. We don't run away from the spiritual material world. We don't go onto the mountaintop and we're not celibates. And we drink wine and we marry women, wine women in song, that's next week. But we infuse it with sanctity. Because what's the greatest peace? Birchas Kohanim, the blessing that the priests give out. Yivarech Hashem Vishmarecha, God should guard you. Yisah Hashem Panam Velech Vichunecha, the last one. Ayer Hashem Panam Velech Vichunecha, the last one. Yisah Hashem Panam Velech Yaseim Lecha Shalom. That's how it ends. Yaseim Lecha Shalom. God should give you peace. Lecha is singular. Isn't peace between people? Shouldn't it be Vyaseim Lachem? God should give you plural peace. You should all get along in peace. You can't get, be in peace with everybody else if you're not at peace with yourself. Yaseim Lecha Shalom. God should give you peace. Shabbat is peace. Because Shabbat takes the material world and tells you it's a tool. It's not an end. Don't, you want to be spiritual? Don't run away from the material world. Conquer it. Take advantage of it. Use it to accomplish something. Use it to reflect who you are. Don't use it to create a persona. Use it to reflect who you are. You need to do mitzvot. You need a car to go do mitzvot. You need a car. Your car doesn't create you. You create your car. So when you're buying your car, you're buying it as a tool to serve God, not as a way to make yourself into a somebody. Look at the car I got. You're not building a house. You're building a physical structure for your home because you can't have a co home in the middle of a park. A home needs some beds and some walls and heating and air conditioning. What's the numerical value of Shabbat? Shabbat is 702. Shin is 300. Base is 2. 302. Tough is 400. 702. 7 and 2 is 9. <gasps> Isn't that a problem, Rabbi Feigenbaum? No! You know what 9 is? Told you a thousand times! 
Nine is MS, truth. Aleph is one, Mem is 40. 41 plus 200 plus tough is 441. Four plus four plus one is, is nine. Truth is nine. Why is truth nine? Because nine is a universal number. Nine times two is 18. One plus eight is nine. Nine times three is 27. Two plus seven is nine. Nine times four is 86. Three plus six is nine. Nine times nine is 81. One plus eight is nine. Nine times seven is nine. Nine times anything is nine. Because truth is truth is truth is truth. No matter what you do with truth, it'll all boil it down to truth. And if you're keeping Shabbat and you're celebrating Shabbat and you understand the relationship of you and the material world, you'll always have truth. But the material world is dangerous, my friends. Chodesh HaZelochem Moshe HaKadoshim is very nice if you make it, you're right, it has to be the first, but it's very dangerous. You could get messed up if you're involved in the material world. It could take you over. Wouldn't it be safer to just stay away from the material world? Go up on that mountaintop, just never get married, take a vow of silence. Wouldn't you be safer that way? It is dangerous. And it got misused! <laughs> Adam was created, and he had Shabbat! <laughs> Seventh-day creation, he had Shabbat! One of the famous proofs that there must have been a, uh, the creation account must be correct. How does the whole world have a seven-day week? Famous proof of the safer accusery. The fact that everybody uses the base 10 number, all the monkeys that grew into people had 10 fingers and toes. The fact that the whole world follows the moon of the sun, they looked up all the monkeys that grew into people, followed the moon of the sun. But all the monkeys that grew into people, what they, why they decide to divide up that month, that lunar cycle, into by seven? It doesn't divide by seven. It's the dumbest number on the planet. There's nothing in nature that's seven. Who dreamed up the stupid number of seven for, for, for days of a week? A month is approximately 30 days. Make five weeks of six. Make six weeks of five. Make three of ten. It was a lunatic, stupid monkey ape that came up with the number seven for a day of the week. And all the different monkey apes that grew into people all came up with the number seven. What kind of stupid number is seven? The only reason seven makes sense is because Adam had seven. He passed on everybody had seven. Adam had seven. But what happened to the material world? There was a flood because they misused the material world. They didn't appreciate They couldn't control the material world. And after the flood, things change. The Medrash says that before the flood, there was no such thing as seasons. I forget who it is, a Kliyaka, the Svan, I don't remember who, says the whole idea, seasons, comes because the world is out of tilt, out of access. That tilt happened after, a, after the flood. God said, too much materialism. It's too, you can't have a world where there's no season, it's always sun, it's always night, and it's always easy, it's always beautiful. It got misused. And therefore, after the flood, what does the verse say? God says, Kais v'chor, 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 cold, sun, heat, winter, summer, spring, fall, lo yishmozu. They will never stop. Because there never was such a thing. But now there's going to be, and it'll always, from now on, there'll always be seasons. Because you need to have changing seasons. You need to realize the mature world is not so simple. And that's where the rabbis get the idea, lo yishmozu. You're not allowed to rest. You've got to keep working. Because you've you got to pay attention to the, the material world. And we lost Shabbat. Because they misused the material world. They didn't know how to use it correctly. And then God chose the Jewish people. And he gave them a special, unique soul of a connection to God. And he said, you will be the submission to the world to show how you can use the material world properly. And you will have Shabbat. So came Mount Sinai. After Achodesh Hazel Lachem, after God told the Jewish people, you got to know that your first month is number one is Nisan. That's your value system. No, we're not going to get rid of the material world, but we're just going to make it number seven. And you're going to show the world what it means to use the material world to reflect who you are, not use it to create who you are. So the Jews were given Shabbat, because we have that segula. For the same reason that non-Jews are allowed to bring sacrifices, but only one kind of sacrifice, called the korban ola, the sacrifice that gets consumed totally up on the altar. The korban shlamim, which part of it is eaten by the person who brings it, part of it is eaten by the priest, and part gets consumed on the altar, which is why it's called a shlamim, from the word shalom, peace, because everybody gets to have something of it. Only a Jew can bring that. Only a Jew is a concept of using the material world for spirituality. Only Jews have the concept of, I can eat food, and that's serving God. The non-Jews were not given the skula. They don't have that spiritual inequality to be able to conquer the material world. And therefore they may not keep Shabbat because Shabbat represents number seven. Shabbat represents taking the material world and infusing it with sanctity. They can be sanctified. They want to be sanctified, let them live on a mountaintop, let them take a vow of silence, let them be a celibate. That, 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 that's to a certain extent easier. The challenge 
of taking the material world and using it properly, you've got to have the skula to do that. They can get the skull if they want, they want to join, but there means 613 commandments. Because if you want to be able to use the material world properly and keep Shabbat, that comes with a lot of stuff. You can't just keep Shabbat and nothing else because you, you, you need to have your whole focus. How you run your business has to be based on the laws of the Torah. The kind of food you eat during the week has to be based on the laws of the Torah. You've got to pray three times a day. You keep your soul connected. There's a lot of things you've got to do to keep that spiritual sensitivity. And it culminates in the concept of Shabbat. And therefore, at night when we pray, at night represents darkness and lack of clarity. We mentioned Shabbat Breshis, the original Shabbat of creation. Because material world in and of itself, creation, it's hard always to see how to use it. But that's where we start. You've got to start with the material world. But the material world all by itself is dark and dangerous. Shabbat day, daylight. We then add in Mount Sinai. Ten Commandments, divine revelation. That gives light to the material world. And that's on Shabbat day, we add in that component. And in that tefillah we say, and therefore Shabbat was not given. When Shabbat was given to the world at Mount Sinai, to shed light on that very dark material world, only the people who had that skula, only the people who went through the exodus, only the Jewish people were given that gift. And on Shabbat day it says, below Nesato, God did not give it to the non-Jews. Only those who experience revelation and have that special extra soul, they can shed light on that material world, daylight. But when we end Shabbat, we say, you know, what's our goal, though? Is our goal to keep this to ourselves? No. Our goal is Yemos HaMashiach. Someday the whole world will come to this recognition. What's going to happen when the Messiah comes? The whole world will be full of the knowledge of God. When the whole world will see the light of God and the whole world will see the truth, then yes, well, all the whole world will be able to use the material world properly and it'll be Yom Shekulo Shabbat. It'll all be Shabbat. We want to keep it for ourselves. We want to be a light unto the nations of how to run the world properly and how to run your communities properly, and how to have a marriage which is proper. That's our goal. Let me just end with one quick vort, and then we'll get you out of here. I know I'm a little over, but it's a peladic vort. It's not mine, it's Yismach Moshe. It says Yismach Moshe like this. In the creation, if you remember, when it comes to creating Adam, by the way, when we celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the creation of the world, actually we're celebrating the creation of Adam, not the first six days of, of the first five days. I assume you know that, but that's another topic. Okay, at the creation of Adam, the famous line, Nasa Adam, let us make man. Rabbi Tursky has a great book called Let Us Make Man. And all the comments, God's talking, so let us make man? God's not us. <laughs> Who's us? So some commentaries say he was, he was taking advice from the ministering angels because he was teaching you Derek Harris when you're doing something, talk to the people that you're working with, don't run the show all by yourself, even God. It's sort of like ask their opinion to sort of bring him in. <laughs> Says he is about Moshe, you know who us is? God could not make Adam, not Adam as in Adam and Eve, but Adam, humans. God could not make Adam all by himself. All God can do is give raw material. God can create a walking, talking, two-legged mammal. And Adam is a combination of God's raw material and the Adam's free will choices that turns that raw material into something. That's called an Adam. Without your choices, you're a walking, talking mammal. You're not Adam. So God says, Nessa, we will create Adam. Who's we? Me and the humans. I'll put in the raw material. The humans will put in their free will choices, and together that will create Adam, for better or for worse, depending on your free will choices. You have free will. Before you're born, it is decreed whether you'll be rich or poor, sick or healthy, but it's not decreed whether you'll be righteous or wicked. We have total free will on, our, on those decisions. We take the material world as raw material, and our job on this earth is to use our free will choices. Don't let the material world create who you are. Your choices decide what you do with that material world and it reflects your values. And what's the numerical value of Adam? 
Aleph is 1, Dalit is 4, 1 and 4 is 5, Mem is 40, 45, 4 plus 5 is 9, MS, truth. You use your free will choices properly. That's what the ultimate truth is. You create Adam. You create sanctity in the material world. And Shabbos represents it. What does the Kiddush on wine? What's the singing Ashes Chayel? What's all the Shabbos food about? Just as a hint for next week, everybody knows why do we have two Chalot Friday night? Why do we have two Chalot Friday night? Because the, man, the manna that came down in the desert, they got one portion every day, but it didn't come down on Shabbat. Double came down on Friday. Double manna came down on Friday. So we remember the manna. The Hebrew word for manna was mun. We represent the mun. Mem, nun. Mem is 40. Nun is 50. 40 plus 50 is 90. Manna, the basic substance of food, is also nine, is also truth. But we'll pick that up next week in Mirza Shem. Thank you very much.